Times. Thank you. And next is Matthew, and we're running very fast today. <laughs> okay, hi, I'm Matt Trinish. Um, I'm a developer advocate at IBM. It just means I get to play on cool open source projects. And I'm going to be talking today about using um, MQTT as a unified message bus for between infrastructure services, which is something we did at the, uh, in the OpenStack community infrastructure to solve the problem. So the OpenStack community infrastructure is all open source and is run by an open community. Um, right now, we've got over 40 different services running on over 250 different servers. Um, that's all of those servers are donated public cloud resources um, from various vendors of the OpenStack Foundation. Um, some of these service, services depend on automation from other services. So there are things that like listen to a Garrett event stream and do stuff based on that or things like that. Some, some of these services have end user facing uh, event streams that people can listen to and do things on their local end, on their local side that they want to play with. Um, and if you're trying to navigate this mess of 40 to 50 services, trying to figure out what's going on, you, you, you really have no way to solve it. You, you know, each, each, individual, each individual service has its own thing. Um, and this isn't a unique problem. The Fedora community infrastructure introduced FedMessage to do the same thing. Um, but the problem we had in the OpenStack community with FedMessage was it was based on zero MQ, and we had been using that for some other things and having issues with scaling and network reliability because we are on a public cloud, and one thing they're not is reliable. Um, so we introduced the Firehose, um, which is a MQTT broker for community infrastructure. And any service that has an event stream or emits events, we can just push it to a single place. Um, it has open read access on the IANA standard MQTT port, uh, 1883. We also have a TLS port for people who want to encrypt the public events that it's emitting. Um, we also use that internally for security reasons. And it also supports WebSockets, except there's a bug in LibWebSockets where it kills Mosquito um, and crashes the whole thing if you try to connect to it. Uh, so we have that turned off. Um, for those who aren't familiar with what MQTT is, it's basically a basic PubSub messaging protocol. It's formerly the message queue to limit the transport, but after a long, very lengthy debate in the MQTT Technical Committee Standards Organization, they decided that MQTT doesn't actually stand for anything except MQTT. Um, it's actually an ISO standard. Um, it dates back to 1999. It was a collaboration with IBM and another company. Two guys basically wrote the original standard. Um, it's currently managed by the OASIS uh, group that does open standard stuff. And it's designed to be lightweight, low bandwidth, and handle unreliable networking, because it was really designed for sensor telemetry. And because of that, it's really, really popular in IoT and sensor network applications. It's used everywhere in IoT, home automation, that kind of place. But those constraints are also very similar to public cloud, um, especially the network unreliability. We have issues where just two nodes just randomly can't connect because you know everyone says treat your servers like cattle in the cloud, and there's reasons for that because they go down all the time. And something like MQTT, which is designed for you know a sensor that's on a pole that gets struck by lightning, um, it's pretty similar. Um, and the other real big advantage is there's a huge application ecosystem around MQTT because it's been around for 20 years. People have been using it for all sorts of things. And there's lots of applications out there. Um, to go into a bit more detail on MQTT and why it's a good fit, I figured I should explain some of its internals. So it's a centralized broker model for those who are familiar with some um, other machine-to-machine uh, -machine messaging platforms. Um, so there's a central broker, and there are tons of open source and closed source um, options out there. I know my employer has both a product you can buy and run your own MQTT broker, and they also have a cloud service that offers one. I know Amazon has a cloud service for MQTT brokers. And then there are clients, which are just things that connect to the broker. And there are bindings for every single language I've heard of, and then some that I wish I didn't know existed, like Lotus Script. Um, and Eclipse actually has the PAHO project, which is pretty cool. It's a attempt to have pretty similar looking bindings for um, different languages. So it's got like Python, Java, C, Go. They're working on a Rust implementation. And the way you interact with them, despite you know, the differences in language syntax, they're pretty similar looking. And 
basic constructs are pretty similar, as much as you can do between multiple languages. Um, and this is the next thing is the topics in MQTT. And this is where we really found this was super useful, especially compared to zero MQ, um, is that topics are generated dynamically and are hierarchical and support wildcarding. So it's kind of hard to understand, so I put this example up there. Um, so this is just um, an example topic that you could publish to. So my laptop, that's my host name, Cyanogio. Um, and I have a base topic sensors, uh, host name, the temperature sensor, and then the hard drive device. And if I want to subscribe to just the hard drive temperature on my laptop, that's the first one. If I want to subscribe to all temperatures on all hosts, that's the second one. Uh, plus is just a one level wildcard, so you can put that anywhere in the hierarchy. It's sla slash separated. Um, if I want all the temperatures on my laptop, set the host name, and I just add the one level wildcard at the end. Or if I want all sensor data for my laptop, I just use the hash, which means everything after doesn't matter, listen to it. And with this, this gives you the ability on the client side for your subscription to only get the set of information you want. It's not just a static, you know, static topic that you get everything and then you have to filter on the client and hope you can keep up on your local machine. And the other thing it does is have multiple levels of quality of service. Um, so there's level zero, which is I send it and maybe you'll get it. Um, there's level one, which is you'll get it at least once, but maybe more than once. And then there's level two, which does a four-step handshaking process to make sure that you get it once and exactly once. And it goes to all available effort to get that. Um, and the interesting thing with quality of service is it's done at publish and subscribe time. So the thing that's publishing a message to the broker can say, this message will be quality of service level two, but only this message. And the rest of the messages that client is publishing to the broker could be zero. So you can, as an application writer, speci uh, specify this message is really important. We don't want to ever lose this data. Let's use two. But that's because there's all of this extra overhead with it, for the unimportant messages, we don't have to care. And then on the client side, that the subscriber, you can say, I want to subscribe with quality of service level two, which means every message that the broker is sending me, I'll make sure I get exactly one of them. Or you cannot care. This does leave you in an interesting place, though, where as a client, you can say, I want to go to all effort to get it once and exactly once. But then the publisher doesn't care, and you're dropping messages on the publish side. So you have to be careful when you're negotiating this. Um, so that was just a little overview of MQTT. Getting back to OpenStax community infrastructure and the firehose, part of the lightweight design thing is you don't actually need that much resources to run it. Um, so in our case, we're running the Mosquito MQTT broker. Um, we're running one server that's got two virtual CPUs. The kernel is reporting 2.6 gigahertz. Um, I don't remember the model number. It's got two gigs of RAM, 40 gig disk, and the thing that's actually a bigger problem is the bandwidth, because we only get 200 megabits per second. But that's a pretty modest server, um, especially by today's standards. Um, just for a little background, Mosquito, the MQTT broker we're using, is a, implemented in C. We chose it because it's C, and we know how to deploy and scale C software. Um, a lot of the alternatives out there are written in Erlang, and that actually makes sense, because Erlang was designed to do this kind of thing but we had trouble scaling it and we, had, we weren't as familiar with it, so we picked this. Um, and the advantage with Mosquito is it's super lightweight. It's like really small. I mean, the only issue we have with it is that LibWebSockets bug which crashes it. Um, and it supports 3.1 and 3.11 of the MQTT spec and it's an Eclipse project. Um, right now, we've got five services um, reporting to the firehose from the community infrastructure. Um, these are five of the higher traffic ones, um, mostly because they're the things that manage all of the infrastructure or the things that users are touching every day. Um, so we've got Ansible. The community infrastructure is um, all Puppet, but it's orchestrated with Ansible. So Ansible is launching Puppet on all of the servers. Um, and we have, I wrote an MQTT callback plugin that will emit an MQTT not uh, notification and push it to the broker every time Ansible does a task or finishes a, I can't remember what all of the words are, but whenever it finishes something, it will push it to um, MQTT. Then we also have um, a Garrett 
MQTT plugin. So every event in our Garrett review system instance that we're running, which is quite large, we go through about 10,000 reviews every month or so. It's crazy. Um, that pushes MQTT. Then I wrote a Launchpad um, translator for a Launchpad event stream for bugs. So new bug events, bugs are open, bugs are commented on, bugs are closed. Um, that pushes to MQT as, MQTT as well. That one is interesting because Launchpad doesn't actually have a user-facing event stream. So we kind of cheated and uh, used email and IMAP. So it subscribes to all of the bugs on email and we listen to IMAP and <laughs> push it to MQTT. <laughs> um, and then there are two internal services we run for collecting test results and, and um, logs from test runs in our CI system. And whenever those are done, we just push events to MQTT in case we wanted to trigger automation after those events are processed. Um, and that gives us a good starting point um, to play around with this stuff. Um, so right now with those five services, I took some data from the production system we're typically averaging about two and a half thousand to one and a half thousand um, messages per minute, which unfortunately is a weird metric to use, but that's what the, um, the broker is reporting to us. And it, you can see it cycles, and those pi uh, spikes are the cron jobs for Ansible running Puppet on all the machines. So we've got 250 machines, and it's just Ansible is running a lot of tasks, and it's pushing that out. Um, if you want to visualize that in a even more esoteric measurement bytes per minute. Um, this is, um, we're pi uh, peaking at two and a half million bytes per minute. Um, I'll leave that exercise to convert to a useful unit up to you guys. <laughs> um, and then we did some manual load testing just for fun to see how far we could push it. Um, and we were able to get it up to about two million messages per minute uh, before we hit a hard wall on our bandwidth limitation in our public cloud provider. Um, and that was pretty cool. But what was even cooler was the system load when we did that. Um, the graph on the left is CPU load. Uh, we got to about 20 or 30% uh, per user, which it's running in user space, so it's um, not that much. And on the RAM side, we pushed to about a gig and a quarter um, of user memory, and then the rest is caching and buffering. Um, so we're pushing, what was it, two, two million messages per minute, and like using no resources, which is pretty cool, except for bandwidth, which is why we had to stop testing. Um, so it's really lightweight and efficient. And also, if there was a network outage, it would handle seamlessly, because we, between the QoS and persistent clients, you can guarantee delivery of these messages. Um, so what are we using it for? Unfortunately, not too much. Um, it doesn't seem to be the most popular thing for end users, and we have other priorities in the community infrastructure, so we can't hack with it too much. One thing is there are third-party CI operators who use um, run tests for OpenStack locally for like proprietary hardware and push results. Some of them are listening to the firehose to get events to trigger test runs. Um, I also know of a few people doing that who are also using miniature firehoses or MQTT brokers for their own event notification locally. Um, I know of several users who are using this MQTT warn package, which was developed independently um, by someone who um, plays a lot with MQTT. Um, he, this will generate desktop notifications or text messages or any other kind of notification that you'd want. And you just have a YAML syntax. Um, and you can just say, OK, I'm running a Mac. Use the Mac notification thing on this subscription. And it'll just print stuff out. Um, we do use it for some inter-service communication. We have a little um, bot for IRC that will report Garrett messages. That listens to MQTT now. And we also do some metric gathering, which are those projects there, um, which I use to generate those quite clearly screen-captured graphonographs. Um, with that, I put up a ton of information. I only had 15 minutes, so there was only so much detail I could go into. I don't think I have any time for questions, but I'll leave this up until they change it. Thanks. <laughs>